I'd like, if I possibly can, to talk about two projects. Um, one uh, is King's Cross, where, which has a plan, and which we were involved in, in, in uh, the development of that plan. And the other is Bankside, which is somewhere which doesn't have a plan, but is important for us because it's where we work and where we've built a number of buildings. Um, King's Cross is obviously an extraordinary site. It's the land between the two stations. It's land that became available for development when the Eurostar station was, um, was being built. Indeed, it helped, the development helped to fund the railway. Um, and in the middle of the site, it contains some really wonderful historical artifacts from the canal to the gas holders, to the granary, to the transit sheds, and so on. Um, one interesting thing about it is that when you look at its history, you realize that actually this was a completely developed, mature piece of city before the railways arrived. So they didn't arrive in space, they arrived into the city. So that's a plan before St Pancras was constructed, only King's Cross was there. So cities, it, by their very nature, are things that change. They are always changing. And actually, if they don't change, to me, that's the point at which they start to die. They, they thrive, if you like, on change. The master plan for King's Cross, that, um, when we worked on it, we produced drawings like this, drawings which tried to convey what sort of place we were making. So we um, imagined enough about it that we could produce uh, a computer model and a physical model uh, to illustrate how buildings and landscapes might be introduced into the site. But in a way, a master plan like this isn't really about that visualization. It's actually a much simpler thing. It's a broad disposition of built form across a landscape. Um, and in a way, you look at this, it's, it's sort of out of date. It's not exactly what we built. It's not exactly what we made a planning application for. But essentially, that master plan is still the master plan which is being carried out, so a very straightforward thing. But what is true is that um, where the master plan is much more specific is, think, is about the definition of the public spaces. So in a way, while the buildings are a bit kind of unknown when we're working on these projects, the thing we make, a much, we make a much bigger commitment to are the nature of the public spaces. They become fixes in the planning process, and although they get developed, they actually change much, much less, in fact, as the project proceeds. And of course, one of the, one of the most important public spaces at King's Cross has been the Granary Square, the space that lies in front of the granary and connects to the canal. Um, and this is a, an early CGI, and in a way, when you go there now, you sort of feel it is more or less like that. It's the thing which has flowed fairly naturally out of the planning process. Now, the, what I just want to say a word about is the fact that, uh, in a way, when we, um, when we carry out these sorts of projects at this scale, we are, of course, making a number of commitments about what's going to be built on the site. So... Um, there are parts of this site where we are saying precisely what uses might go on in buildings, uh, both at ground floor level and in the upper parts of the building. We are committing to, some, some, to certain quantums of space that are going to be built within the site. I mean, sometimes there's a minimum, sometimes there are maximum. Um, and as I say, we're committing to a certain sense of how the spaces are going to function, the role they have, and their character and their identity. But there are also lots of things that just aren't fixed in, in a master plan like this. So one of, one of them, for example, is the granary, which is now occupied by Central St. Martins. When the planning application was made, nobody had a clue that they might be the occupants. We actually had no idea at all what that building was going to be used for. We knew it was going to be kept. We knew it was a really important building on the site, but we were completely dependent, really, on the imagination of, of our client to keep talking to people and begin to draw people into the project uh, and suggest what might happen there. And I just really to make the point that I, don't, I think in the end there's a limit to what the, the master planner or the urban designer can do. You, can, you may be able to suggest the odd use here and there, but ultimately you're dependent on a whole lot of other people thinking about and imagining what might be possible. Uh, I mean, just on uses, we... We, in, in King's Cross, we, uh, we do define some building plots, but we also have plots where we said they could be a number of different uses. They're not fixes at all. As the plan proceeds, you can change it. And we also have a, an arrangement which is unusual where we say that there's a, uh, in, in each use category, there's a maximum use and there's a minimum use. But actually within that, there's a zone of tolerance. So that the, 
the, the nature of the place isn't fixed when you put the planning application. It's something which is inevitably going to evolve over time. And that characteristic, I think, is a very important one. I think, in a way, these sort of planning applications, on the one hand, have to provide enough fixity so that everybody, the public, the, the people who live locally, the planners, can buy into the idea that this thing is going to be acceptable to everybody. So you have to kind of pin some things down, but you also need flexibility, I think. I think you have to have within them a kind of an inherent, a kind of open-endedness to enable them to evolve over time. And in our planning documentation, we try and, we try and introduce that into the documentation. So while the red lines on, on there, and um, in a way the purple lines which are given are fixes in the plan, where the secondary and tertiary routes go are not at all fixed. We, we, there's an obligation to have them. We want the sense of a grain within the master plan, but they're not physical things on the ground which are determined by the planning application. This question of, of um, how to explain this and talk about this has to be addressed, of course, and one of the ways we did it was to, to, to develop a kind of proposition with buildings across the site. If you add up all the area, you get the area that we've applied for planning for. But if you actually look at the rules about how tall buildings can be or how low they can be, because actually we apply both those rules, uh, you get different shapes. So this, this is drawing is entirely done for the planners to understand the relationship between our picture of what might happen and actually the set of parameters which they're approving and uh, within which buildings can be built. You can't build everywhere, because if you build everywhere, you'd have built too much area. So these things are working sort of side by side. And that, 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 that character is also something we try and work with, even with things like the cross-section through the street. So there are, our plans say, well, you have to let a certain amount of light into the center of the street. But actually, depending on how you behave on one side of the road affects the, what you can build on the other side. So our plans don't say every building should be five stories high and then they should set back. They say, well, you start the process off, you will gradually create the sort of place you want to create, but you will have to conform to these environmental standards. Now, I think some people would like plans to be more rigid than that, more defined, but I think it's, a much, more, it's much more like the real world in a way. It's, a, in a sense, a master plan trying to behave like a real city behaves. And ultimately, it's a much more interesting plan to participate in as a designer, as an architect contributing buildings. And just as a kind of record, this is shows all the different architects who now design buildings across King's Cross. Um, and, and in grey, the colours show the actual designs, and in grey you see the, the shapes that we were anticipating being built at the time of the master plan. So you can see that evolution in process. Now, the only place where we're really strict is actually on the edges of our site. In other words, it's, it's almost more important to look really, really carefully, we think, at the edges of our sites and the relationships which we build up there, because that sense of connectivity with the world off our site is actually perhaps almost the hardest thing to achieve. And I suppose from our point of view, what that means is we want to feel as if our, our master plans simply flow naturally into the grain and structure of the surrounding city. And we, we've, we've tried on, uh, frequently now to try and show this in the end by using the London A to Z. You can see very clearly King's Cross. It's an area of white because it's completely inaccessible to the public, uh, completely different from the structure around about. But as you look at, if you lay in the King's Cross Master Plan, the whole point of it is that it just becomes sort of seamless or as seamless as we can make it in with the rest of the city. And the point of that is really that the success of King's Cross in the end will depend on its ability to be assimilated by everybody outside the site, not really just by the people inside the site. And I really feel that is happening there. There's no question but that the people who live locally have adopted the public spaces of King's Cross as amenities which are relevant to them. Uh, they use them, their children use them. And I suppose what's really intriguing watching this happen is how even while the, it's still effectively a building site because the public spaces were put in there early on, um, because the public spaces were put in, uh, in there early on, uh, people began to use them. Two minutes. Um, so, so just to qu switch quickly to um, Bankside. Bankside, very curious part of London. 
um, again, a very ancient path, but one which has been radically changed in the 19th century, by, firstly by the railway lines and then by Southwark Street, which cut through the whole thing. Um, it's in the last, um, well, should we say 20 years, and I actually find out 25 years is also my sense of how long these projects take to carry out. I think they'll all take about 25 years. Um, this is looking at Southwark Street, Tate Modern at the top, um, the site of their extension, the big three um, holes in the ground, the big tanks in the ground. What's interesting, I think, though, is that when you look at Bankside, and maybe I've almost got to stop there, is that Bankside is interestingly being carried out without, completely without a master plan. There's no plan being provided by the local authority. The local authority, of course, is a participant, judging schemes, reflecting on what might happen, but there's no overriding plan. But... At the same time, there have been a series of interventions which have been come into play in Bankside, many of which actually have involved government or GLA London funding. Um, I'm just showing where we, where we crop up in that, in that time cycle. Um, so in a way, you have a situation where, without a plan, nevertheless, by these kind of key uh, interventions, these key um, investments, you have an opportunity to really change things. And just one last thing to say, what's intriguing is that the two really big ones, in a way, I think, were the construction of the Globe Theatre at the beginning, suddenly kind of shining a light on this part of London, and then Tate Modern in 2000. And what's intriguing is that neither of those projects were initially supported by the local authority. In both cases, particularly the Globe, they fought very, very hard to stop it because they saw it as a loss of employment space. So these sort of processes are very, very complicated, I think. And in a way that I don't think there's, in, in sort of outlining these two examples, it just, I just hope to show that there are, they can unfold in many different ways. Thank you.